blasting into your ear holes with your eyeballs. This is Vagabond Repertory Theater Company's first online stage presentation. Welcome, everybody. My name is Dane Forgione. I am the founder and director of Rep Vagabond Repertory Theater Company. And we are presenting tonight, for your enjoyment, the return of young Sherlock Holmes, the young Sherlock Holmes adventure, The Caper at Christmas. We're going to get started in just a few minutes, but I would like to, uh, before we do that, I would like to introduce the, uh, the players for this evening. We're going to start from the top and work our way down. That's not to say that some people are lower than the other. Everybody here is equally as important. So we're going to start with our main man, the leading man, playing the role of young Sherlock Holmes. It's Jackson Babilis. Say hello, Jackson. Hi. So um, how you doing, Jackson? You, you're excited? Yeah. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. Yeah. That's great, my boy. Moving right along, um, this young man is playing Watson. Um, past roles that he's done include The Beast, Oliver, and Horton. Quite the young gamut of characters. He's a very funny fellow. His name is Nathan Kasoy. Nathan, say hello. Hello. <laughs> He's from Mother Russia, apparently. <laughs> How do you do, sir? Um, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing fine. That thanks for asking. You're very. That's very nice of you to ask. Well, gee, that's just. That's just. That's just great. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our leading lady for this evening. She is reprising her role as Grace Duvall. She's a terrific, terrific actress in the Pennsylvania area. She is a just a darn, darn great actress, very talented. Shannon Ship, big round of applause. How do you do, Shannon? I'm amazing. How are you? I'm doing spectacular. Thank you. Awesome. Moving right along. We have a young man here playing Lestrade. Well, in the future, he becomes Inspector Lestrade. He is Owen Connors. Owen Connors is in the house. Hello there. Rocking and rolling, strutting and strolling. How are you doing, Owen? Good. Happy April Fool's Day, everyone. Happy April Fool's Day. Yes. All right, let's single out the bad guy, the main bad guy. Playing the role of Moriarty, we have Talon Arbazu. Hey, man, how you doing? I'm doing fine. And uh, sitting directly to his left or or his right, I'm not actually, I'm not quite sure, uh, is his brother Reese Arbazu, who is playing uh, Jarvis the Lackey. Hey, how you doing? Doing fine, doing fine. Up next, playing the role of Amaryllis. Grace's best friend, Toria Kurdla. It's Kurdilla. Hi. Kurdilla. My, my bad. It's okay. Everyone mixes it up. Yes. Hello, everyone. Now that we've got the talented youngsters out of the way, let's, let's introduce um, our three adults in the cast this evening. They are part of the mental crew. Uh, going down the list here, playing the role, Professor Duvall, very funny fellow. Uh, he's a voice actor, he's a producer, and he's just a, an all-around great guy, uh, Mr. Jason Amherst. Hi, diddly -o, everybody. How you doing, Flanders? Oakley doakley do. Stupid Flanders. So... Next up, playing the role of Headmistress Merlin, we have Ashley Miller. Bonjour. 
Bonsoir. Trivian. Uh, gracias. <laughs> okay. <laughs> last, but, last but certainly not least, um, my co cohort of over 20 years is playing the narrator this evening. He, uh, he's in charge of mental television, which you can see all over Facebook and YouTube. We have Mr. Mike Riley. Hello. Some of you know um, Mike from his many shows where I kind of piggyback off of him. Well, tonight he's piggybacking off of me. That's great. So these are what coattails feel like. Yeah. <laughs> now, tonight's show is benefiting uh, the Actors Fund. Now, as I'm sure everybody is well aware of the uh, situation that's going on in the world um, with the um, with this situation, uh, a lot of great actors and actresses in the Broadway area are right now out of work. Some shows are unfortunately not able to come back. So the Actors Fund set up to help people in this situation, help pay for their services and keep them afloat. Now, um, if you'd like to donate, I will give the information in just a moment. You can go to the Actors Fund uh, website, and there is, all, well, also, uh, if you go to my Facebook page, which is just, well, my name, Dane Forgione, um, my uh, birthday um, wish was for people to donate to the Actors Fund, so you can also donate there. Now, we are going to get started in just a moment, where, as Mike Riley gets his script ready, as the actors are all departing, getting ready to go. Um, this was, I'm very excited about this. Um, these 10 actors are extremely talented. Everyone more talented than the rest. I was extremely pleased with the amount of talent that came through here. I'm very, very lucky as a director to have such talent um, surrounding my show, bringing it to life. Uh, this was one of the first major plays that I wrote. It um, got into two festivals, and it was actually nominated for costumes. So that was something that I was extremely proud of. I was very proud of the cast then, and I'm very proud of them now. So, um, without further ado... We are going to get started. Just picture, uh, if you will, a classroom setting in Victorian London around the time of the 1860s, 1870s, I would say, where we see young Sherlock Holmes before he became the famous detective that he was today. All right. Mr. Riley, please. Let us in. Yes, Mr. Forgione. The lights slowly fade up on stage to a schoolroom setting. Several desks and chairs are on stage, filled with young students aged 11 to 13, along with a blackboard at the front, where a man holding a large textbook and a piece of chalk, presumably a teacher, is standing. He's in the middle of teaching a lesson, and the kids present seem as if they'd rather be elsewhere. Now then. If we were to take the sum of those three numbers from our previous questions and divide it by four, then multiply it by seven, what would our answer be? Oh, come now. None of you know the answer? <sighs> come now, children. I know that your Christmas break is coming in a day or so, but that doesn't mean you should all shut your minds off until after the new year. 
All right, I shall put you all out of your mystery. The answer, of course, is 721. Now then, let's move on to another question. 724, sir. Huh? What was that? Speak up. Professor Duval, your math was slightly off. If you divide the previous numbers by 4, then multiply by 7, you actually get 724, not 721. It's okay, though. It was an honest mistake. Sherlock Holmes. Why am I not surprised you'd be the one to catch a mistake like that, as well as be the one who'd correct me? Well, my apologies, sir, but... I'm sure you want to teach the class the correct answer, right? I mean, I at least hope you would. <laughs> Quiet. Master Holmes, you are a student here. I, I am the teacher. What makes you so sure you're actually correct? Uh, pr professor, I think Sherlock, it, Sherlock is right because... Well, he's shown himself to be really good at math. I, I, I mean that in the nicest way, of course, sir. Hmm. John Watson, of course. If Holmes here is involved in something, you're never too far away. Forgive me, sir. I suppose we've been best friends for so long, it's, uh, it's a force of habit. Oh, for goodness sake. Forgive Watson, sir. It's my fault. I was the one who spoke first. I just wanted to do what was right, though. Well, we can very easily settle this. Let me just check the answer. Duval quickly begins to jot the math equation down on a slip of paper in his hand. He soon pauses and looks up at Holmes, then at the paper, then at Holmes again. 724, sir? <sighs> 724, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> ring, ring. Well, thank you all for that <clears throat> engaging class. Remember, the Christmas ball is tonight, so dress nicely and be and behave yourselves. <clears throat> Holmes, come here, boy. Yes, sir. Mr. Holmes, I've been pondering for a long while about you, boy. And I've come to one conclusion. You are an extremely bright, well-versed, educated young man. And I feel that someday you will make a fine teacher. A fine anything, for that matter. I'm almost certain that no matter what you decide to do in life, you will be the best at it because you apply yourself and you do the best possible job at it. However, on the other side of the coin... You also annoy the very dickens out of me with your backtalk, your know-it-all attitude, and your sometimes disrespect for authority. So if you are to work on one thing, just one thing, over this Christmas break, it would be to show me some respect, for goodness sake. Of course, sir. I promise. Very well, then. Off you go, my lad. Holmes, just remember... You've got a special gift laying up there. All you need to do is apply it correctly, and the world is yours. Otherwise, you'll be just a smart aleck with no purpose. Duly noted, sir. With that, he walks off stage as Duvall slowly shakes his head. Bloody hell. That boy could probably teach this class if he wanted to. If he wasn't so frustratingly annoying in certain aspects, I might just let him. The lights fade out. After a scene change, lights fade up to a hallway setting, which is lit by candlelight, where several teachers and students are milling about. A statue is present in the middle of the stage, that of what appears to be a scholar holding a scepter in one hand and a book in the other. Holmes appears on stage and walks across it, soon to be met by Watson. There you are, Sherlock! Gosh, Devil Duval kept you so long! I thought it was the end of you! Nonsense, John. It was just a discussion. Man to man, is all. Oh, he let you have it, didn't he? And then some. Well, this thing will pass, Sherlock. For now, let's concentrate on the Christmas ball tonight. 
Have you a suit picked out? But of course. Suddenly, as the two boys stop by the statue, a third boy, holding a ruler in his hand and looking authoritative, comes before them and strikes a policeman-like pose. This boy is Jerry Lestrade, better known to Holmes readers as Inspector Lestrade as an adult. Hold it, hold it, hold it. State your business. We've no business, Lestrade. Just passing through. You're patrolling the halls more than usual, Lestrade. Any reason why? See that statue there? Of course. It's the statue of Jones Merriweather. He founded the school. Did you not? Look there, in his left hand. It's a new addition to the statue. Huh, look at that. It's a scepter. Made out of ghouls and with gold without a whole lot of jewels covering it, too. It certainly looks nice. Uh-huh. In D. Merland, he instructed me to guard it. As the prefect, I took that duty without hesitation, and I take my job very seriously. So, go on. Shoo! Sh shoo away! We don't want the statue to have any harm to come to it. Never fear, Jerry. As long as you're around, I'm sure that'll be the case. Watson and Holmes walk away from Lestrade, who salutes and begins to pace back and forth in front of the statue. He certainly takes his duty seriously, eh, Sherlock? Very much so. It's almost as if he's grooming himself to be a policeman. I suppose every boy has a dream, eh? Sure. And do you want to know what I'm dreaming of right now? What's that, Holmes? The sugar cakes at the ball tonight. Miss Deckard, the cook, makes the most divine ones. Oh, Sherlock, you ought to be careful. If you eat too many of those, you'll be dreaming of something else besides sugar plums dancing in your head. Oh? And what's that? Stomach aches! <laughs> Slowly, the lights dim. As some festive instrumental Christmas music plays, the lights come back up to a stage set up for a Christmas ball. Several students, boys and girls, are filing in, all pantomiming conversations with one another. Soon, Headmistress Merlin comes shuffling onto the stage with her secretary. The headmistress approaches a podium by the back of the stage, then begins to speak. <laughs> ah, good evening to you, children. Now then, before our Christmas ball begins, I have a few words I'd like to say. Now, uh... Oh dear. Where did I put my speech? I swear I had it a moment ago. Our uh, head, Mistress Merlin. Oh gracious me. I should have my head examined. I know I came here with my speech. Where on earth could it be? Uh, uh ma'am, your speech is, uh... No, no, I don't want any help. I need to find it myself. I... She eyes the paper in her hand. She sheepishly realizes it's her speech, and she looks out to the audience. Well, crisis averted. Ahem. Now, children, remember, this is not just a time about receiving gifts, but also giving of yourselves. Whether it be friendship or time for studies and charity, Christmas might come only once a year, but you should always be mindful of such good deeds the whole year through. Now then, let's have a splendid time at the ball tonight. Headmistress Merlin waves with a big grin and is led off stage as Watson and Holmes come walking on side by side. Gosh, Sherlock, they certainly went all out in decorating the banquet hall for this year's Christmas balls. Indeed, they did, Watson. Though, it appears to me it was a rushed job, done at the last minute. I don't blame them, though. With what with our final test for the year being delayed until just a short time ago. A rushed job, Sherlock? What makes you say that? Well, it's quite simple, really. A mere accusatory glance shows that several of the decorations are hung at odd angles. None of them match one, one another or in any sort of straight line. Not to mention that there's different colored tinsel hanging from there, 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 and there. Sometimes, Holmes, I forget just how much attention to detail you possess. More students arrive, their voices heard off stage. Two girls, Grace and Amaryllis, come on stage, whispering with one another and looking around with excitement. Tell me, Watson, what is your wish for the upcoming New Year? Me? Well, 
I, of course, I'm excited to see my parents back home. I'm looking forward to Christmas Eve there. One of these days, you ought to visit me around the holidays. My mother cooks the finest Christmas goose you've ever tasted. We sing carols, we go outside to watch the snow fall, when there is some. And my father tells a lot of wonderful ghost stories at night. And what about you, Sherlock? What is your wish for the upcoming year? Slowly, the two girls that came in on the other side of the stage spot Holmes and Watson, and the spotlight shines on one, Grace. She is dressed in a green gown with matching gloves. Holmes' eyes meet hers, and she smiles sweetly and waves to him, and then looks away shyly. Holmes is awed. He obviously knows this girl from what we can see. Why tell you when I could show you, my friend? Huh? You mean Grace Duvall? The very same. My word, but Sherlock, she's... The most beautiful girl I've ever seen. Well, yes, she is very pretty, you're right. But don't forget, she's Professor Duvall's daughter. And I think we know how he feels about you at the moment. Watson, in life, I found I find one thing to be very true. You miss 100% of the chances that you never take. Excuse me for a moment. With that, he walks away from Watson and over to Grace and Amaryllis. Slowly, he taps Grace on the shoulder and she turns to face him. Hello, Sherlock. Merry Christmas. Hello, Grace and Amaryllis. A Merry Christmas to you as well. Amaryllis giggles and a walk off to Watson where he, st where she steals glances at Lestrade while miming talk with Watson. Grace and Holmes are now standing together in shy silence. You look very lovely today, tonight, Grace. And your dress is beautiful, too. This old thing? Oh, it's just something I found at the last minute. Well, it looks great. But then again... Anything you wear looks beautiful on you. Aren't you the sweetest thing? You know, you're looking very handsome yourself tonight, Sherlock. Oh, well, gosh, I didn't know about that. Sherlock, you're blushing. Am I? You are. Come now. You don't need to be shy around me. Some music begins to play. She continues. Come on, Sherlock. Dance with me. I... I would, but alas, I don't really know how to dance very well. It's fine if we can't do it well, as long as it's you dancing with me. Please, for me. For you, yes. He bows to her as she smiles and curtsies. Soon they begin to waltz with one another. Meanwhile, two new boys come walking into the room, both with an air of menace to them. One of them is James Moriarty. The other is Jarvis, his lackey. The two push their way past several kids, then slowly zero in on Watson. Jarvis sidles up next to Watson and flicks his nose as Moriarty stands off to the side of the two. Jarvis leers at Amaryllis. Ow, hey! What'd you do that for? Because you were in my way, squirt. Hi, Armadillo. That's Amaryllis. I was nowhere near you, Jarvis. Could you just leave me alone? For a day? Gosh, let me think about that. Nope, I guess not. <laughs> he cackles and gives Amaryllis an awkwardly playful punch on the arm. I don't want to have to cause a scene, but I'll defend myself and the lady if I must. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Ahem. Come now, Watson. I don't really appreciate you speaking to my friend that way. He was only kidding you. <laughs> yeah, only kidding. <sighs> Look, Moriarty, just leave me alone, won't you? I came here to have fun, not be one of your victims. That's all well and good. But you see, Watson, dear boy, this kind of thing is how Jarvis and I like to have fun. Yeah, lots of fun. Right, Armadillo? That's Amaryllis, you Neanderthal. Moriarty and Jarvis sandwich Watson in the middle of them and push him back and forth, cackling as they do. Meanwhile, Holmes, still waltzing with Grace, spots what's happening, stops waltzing, and frowns. Sherlock, why did you stop? Would you pardon me for a moment, Grace? He storms over to the three boys, Grace trailing not far behind him. Hey! Well, look who it is. The know-it-all, Sherlock Holmes. Come to save your dear friend, have you? 
Moriarty, don't you have anything better to do than menace people for no reason? If it upsets you that much, not at all. Well, if you're going to target someone, target me. Leave John alone. And you leave Amaryllis alone. Is that a challenge? It is. Well, I'm certainly going to enjoy this night even more now. Yeah, me too. That's enough, James. Leave all of them alone. Moriarty pauses, then his eyes fall on Grace. He immediately pushes Holmes aside and, dripping with charm, speaks to her. Why, Grace, I wasn't aware you were here. You're looking very lovely tonight. I was trying to make sure you didn't see me for a reason. Oh, come now, Grace. Is that any way to speak to me? You think your father would teach you better manners. I reserve manners for those who deserve them. And you two definitely don't fit the bill with your behavior. <laughs> so you're siding with them, are you? How is it that someone so beautiful can also be so dumb? Typical girl, wouldn't you say, Jarvis? Ha, yeah, typical. Don't speak to her like that. She's a lady, and she's to be treated as such. I wasn't talking to you, was I? I was talking to her. Come now, my lady. Forget about these fools and dance with me, would you? I'd rather sit on a cactus. Amaryllis giggles, and Jarvis can't help but cackle at this. Moriarty shoots him a dirty look. Shut up. As for you, I'll teach you to show me the proper respect. He goes to grab Grace's arm, but Holmes, quick as a flash, smacks his arm away, then palm strikes Moriarty in the chest, sending him backwards. Jarvis tries to jump in for defense, but Holmes chops Jarvis in the shoulder, sending him scurrying as well. By now, everyone in attendance has stopped dancing and talking and are watching the unfolding events. It's a fight! Oh, it's a fight! Oh my god! Oh, 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 You're not going to get away with this, you worm! Before the fight can progress, though, a loud, booming voice can be heard from off stage. All right, all right. That's enough of that! Slowly, Professor Duvall steps onto the stage and up to the kids. Jarvis and Moriarty try to straighten out their clothes as much as possible. Father, thank goodness you're here! What is all this blasted commotion? What are you hooligans up to, huh? It, it was that, sir. That's a lie. Yeah, we didn't do anything. Everyone here saw you try to manhandle Grace. That's right. Did you two creatures try and lay hands on my daughter? Of course not, sir. We didn't lay one finger on her. Yes, he did. I saw it too, sir. If Sherlock over there hadn't stopped us, we would have, though. Moriarty elbows him hard in the gut. <clears throat> oh, I wasn't supposed to admit that, was I? Uh, oops. I think it's time you two ruffians went back to your rooms. Now! And you will be brought to the dean's office in the morning to speak about this. Understood? Understood? Yes, sir. <laughs> Get going. He eyes Holmes briefly, then nods. As for you, Master Holmes, you defended my daughter's honor, did you? Well, while I may not appreciate your candor in the classroom, my boy, this action will certainly not go unnoticed. Carry on, lad. Carry on. Thank you, sir. Duvall hugs his daughter and he walks off as Jarvis scurries away. Moriarty goes to leave, but he first steps up to Holmes and points a finger at him. Words cannot describe how much I despise you, Holmes. This isn't the end of this. I, 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 Sherlock, that was absolutely amazing. You really showed those two what for. Where did you learn fighting moves like that? My brother, Mycroft, of course. It always pays to have an older brother who's experienced in grappling and fighting, as I always say. Golly! I certainly hope you teach me those techniques sometime. <laughs> of course I will, friend. Of course I will. Watson, sensing that Holmes wants to talk to Grace alone, backs up a few steps. Um, I've got to see what Lestrade thought of that fight. Uh, come on, Amaryllis. We'll be back soon. Watson and Amaryllis dash off. Are you all right? Yes, yes. I'm fine, thank you. You were so brave back there, Sherlock. 
Not only standing up for John against those two, but standing up for me too. Saving me from that brute, trying to hurt me like he did. Well, what's right is right. Those two can target me if they want, but I'll be damned if I ever let them target my best friend and someone I care about. Like you. You really feel that way? Of course. Well, would you like to hear something I'm sure you already know? I really care about you, too. She steps closer to him. Do you? Mm Mm-hmm. I've liked you for a long time now. And tonight only proves just what a kind, brave, sweet fool you are. She's now even closer to him, and her lips are getting closer to Holmes's as well. Well, well, thank you, Grace. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Here, consider this a thank you for what you've done tonight. I think you really deserve it. She smiles and leans in slowly for a kiss. Holmes also leans in, but just as their lips are inches apart, suddenly the lights on the stage abruptly turn off. Some screams of fright are heard, as well as some general pandemonium. What is happening? Oh my god, the lights turned off. I'm really scared. Somebody help me. Somebody help me, please. What do you think to the lights? Someone turn them on, please. Please, everyone. Oh, Jerry, save me. All right, everyone. Don't panic. Don't panic. As prefect, I'm here to maintain order. All right, everyone, don't panic. Don't panic. As prefect, I'm here to maintain order. Everyone form a line and walk with me this way to safety. Ow. Okay, quick safety tip, don't walk this way. There's a rather big wall blocking the way. Just stay put. Grace? Grace? Are you nearby? Where are you? Sherlock! John, I can hear you, but where are you? Hey, look, I'll come to you. Stay where you are, like the shot said. All right, just follow my voice. I'm right here. We hear footsteps, then... Watson, is that you? Did you find me? Uh, ow, yes, Sherlock, that's my ear. You're grabbing. Sorry. Sherlock, what on earth happened? One second, everyone was dancing and talking. The next minute, the lights went out. It's a good question, Watson. But one we should come back to once we know everything is okay. Hey, who turned off the lights around here? Oh, brother, what are you doing back here? Calm down, Pipsqueak. We're both in our rooms. Then suddenly, the lights doused out. We weren't sure what was going on, so we felt our way down the hall and came here. Safety in numbers, after all. <sighs> Never mind, you two. Have, have any of you heard Grace's voice? I think we'll have separated in all the confusion. I hope she's okay. Children, children, please be calm. We'll have the lights back on in just a moment. Everyone stay still. Don't wander off. Hello? Where is everyone? Grace? Grace, is that you? Father, where are you? I'm frightened. I can't see a thing. Stay calm, my love. Just follow my voice. I'm reaching my hands out for you. There you are. It's okay, my dear. The lights will be back on any moment now. I certainly hope so. Oh, Father, it's all so scary and confusing. So many people were bumping into me. I wasn't sure what to do. Soon, the lights on stage finally come back on. Electric, not candlelight. And the students and teachers all mutter with relief. Amaryllis is happily clinging to Lestrade, who is looking at her like she's out of her mind. He gently extricates himself from her grasp. She looks disappointed. Ah, there we are. He noticed the interaction between Lestrade and Amaryllis, as did everyone, and is amused. (laughs) Is everyone here all right? Grace, are you all right? Yes, yes, I'm okay. I'm so sorry. I got so frightened and disoriented. I wasn't sure where anyone was. Never mind that. As long as you're okay. Yeesh! Your hands are like icicles! You're not that much of a reptile, are you? One more crack like that, I'll pound you, Watson. Aw, you disappoint me, Armadillo. It's Amaryllis. Lestrade looks surprised that he said that, and Amaryllis is happy. It does seem a little strange. It's warm throughout the the whole building, and yet... Here you are, with cold hands. Strange that the lights would all suddenly go out. It must have been a freak occurrence. 
I'm sure things are fine now. You were saying, sir? Headmistress Merlin rushes in, all in a panic. She babbles incoherently as she rushes about. Professor what? Duvall gets her to calm down. I don't know why. I don't know why. Headmistress Merlin. Headmistress Merlin, what on earth is the matter? She babbles gibberish. Ma'am, please, calm yourself. Take a deep breath and tell me what's wrong. Gone. Oh, it's gone. What's gone? The scepter! The scepter from the statue of our school's founder! It's gone! Gone, I tell you! <gasps> Ma'am, are you sure about this? Perhaps you just looked at the statue from the wrong angle. <laughs> wrong angle nothing! It's gone! Someone's pinched it! Alright, nobody move. As prefect, I will place you all in custody until we find the culprit. Everyone simply stares at him. He looks up at Dean Merlin and Professor Duvall. Right? Your enthusiasm is noted, Mr. Lestrade. But leave this to the adults for now, my boy. Who on earth could have done such a thing, Sherlock? Your guess is as good as mine, friend. Anyone here could have done it. The lights were out long enough for anyone to go in the hall without suspicion. Hey, what's that you got there? Excuse me? Right there, tucked into the ruffle of your dress. What are you talking about? Right there. He grabs at her dress, you little pig. Just a minute now. Jarvis is right. I see something there, too. He pushes Jarvis aside, then grabs that and pulls out a gold rod-shaped object from the fold of her dress. Hello? What's this? Scepter. No! So that's what I saw. It was you. You took it. What? I, I have no idea how it even got there. Oh, come now. Do you expect us to believe you didn't know you had something like that hidden in your dress? I wasn't even out in the hallway. I was stumbling about in he here when all of this happened. Ha! A likely story. Well, there's only one thing left to do. Miss Double, I place you under arrest. What? Wait just a minute now. Ma'am, you can't possibly think I'd do this. I would never. Hmm. Miss Duval, how could you? Father, please, get them all to believe me. You know I never do something like this. Professor Duval doesn't respond right away. Father, please, not you two. I'm innocent. Grace, I'm your father. You know I'll always be by your side. But unless you can prove your whereabouts from the last few minutes... Father, please, you you must believe me. I'm not a thief. I agree. Grace was standing with me as the lights were doused out. We were at the furthest point from the door that led into the hall. I highly doubt she could make her way to the statue, take the scepter, and then come back here so quickly. Hmph. How am I not surprised? And just what do you mean by that? Well, of course you're siding with her. You're blinded by your infatuation with her. Tis, tis. Poor love-struck fool that you are. It, it, it's simple common sense! I agree with Sherlock. How on earth could Grace have moved so quickly in the dark? Ah, uh, the evidence is right here. Dean Merlin, I am for one shocked at this. Simply shocked. Why'd you do it, huh, Grace? She didn't. No, I did not. I think I might know why. Isn't it true, Professor, that you were recently passed up for the position of Vice Dean of our school? <laughs> not that it's any concern of yours, but yes, yes I was. Well, then, the way I see it, it was an act of revenge. You were upset that your father didn't get this position, so you decided to desecrate our beloved statue by taking the scepter. Perhaps you were, f you lo were looking for a way to sell it for some money for your family. What a greedy girl she is. You can say that again. 
What a greedy girl she is. Moriarty elbows him in the gut. Ow! Well, you told me to say it again. This is all too much for Grace. She begins to sob into her father's chest. Father, these are all lies. I'm innocent. Why won't you believe me? Why won't you make all of them believe me? <sighs> I'm sorry, my dear. Truly, I am. But once you, sh once you can show me proof, you know I'll believe it in a heartbeat. Oh, father! She breaks off and runs off stage crying. She didn't do it, Moriarty. You know she didn't. Amarilla stamps on Moriarty's foot and runs off stage after Grace. She's escaping! Quick, after her, before she steals more! He follows the girls. Lestrade, get back here! I'll go after her to calm her down. Then we can get to the bottom of this. Please do. With that, everyone exits off stage at different exits until only Holmes and Watson are left alone. Oh, it's really a pickle, Sherlock. A big pickle. Unless there's something we're missing here. Poor Grace. Oh, John, not you too. Believe me, I don't think she did it. But there does not seem to be any evidence so far to suggest that she didn't. Well, I don't think even for a moment it was her. Well, what can be done, Sherlock? How can we figure out who the real culprit was? Elementary, Watson. We simply open our eyes and look at the facts closely. And already, I can tell something is a mess that wasn't before. What is it, Sherlock? Look, the window's up there. They're wide open. Golly, you're right. They are. And those windows weren't open all night. I suspect they were open to get drafts of wind into, to come in and douse the lights. At least in this room, since there are only candles, we're lit tonight. I never thought of that. And look, John. John, you can tell that they were open from the outside. Somebody was outside on the grounds, went up to those windows, and opened them. That's amazing, Holmes. How can you tell? Look. Finger smudges on the outside of the glass. My goodness, you're right. They, they are. There they are, plain as day. I never would have noticed such a thing. Well, now we know that the lights going out wasn't an accident. It appears someone meant for those lights to go out. Yes. But who? Well, I intend to find out. Come, John. There's a little... Uh, let's do a little bit more looking around. Holmes and Watson enter the hallway later on that very night. The scepter is still not with the statue. Well, there it is. Indeed. Come, John. Let's take a closer look. Are you sure about this, Sherlock? What if someone sees us? It'll only take a few m moments. And besides, for Grace, I don't care if I just caught. I just want to prove she's innocent. You really are head over heels, sir, huh? I do believe I am, John. Well, what are we waiting for, then? That's the spirit. Come on, give me a boost. Watson helps Boost Holmes up to take a look at the statue's hand at a closer angle. Uh, do you see anything, Sherlock? Hmm. Aha! Uh -huh. What are you uh hawing about, Sherlock? You spot another clue? I believe I did. The hand on the statue, where the scepter was, it's got smudges on it. All dirt and grease. So... So recall that the windows we saw had a dirt smudge on them as well. Y yeah, yep, that's right. It appears as whoever our culprit was was not only intended to open the windows, but then took the scepter. But what about Grace? Simple, John. Remember that she was wearing gloves the whole night. There's no way she would have left fingerprint smudges on the window. These prints are of someone whose hands were exposed to some element of grime. But what about the scepter being hidden in her dress? My guess is the culprit knew that there was a possibility they were going to be caught. So they planted it onto Grace to throw everyone off. Now, the question, 
who could be the culprit? Suddenly, Lestrade pounces out from a side entrance. He points to the two boys. Aha! Uh -huh. Jerry, is that you? Don't try any sweet talking or funny business, Watson. I've got you and Holmes red handed. What are you talking about? You're obviously trying to contaminate the crime scene somehow. Maybe Moriarty was right. You're clouded for love by Grace Double, so you're covering up her tracks. Don't be ridiculous, Lestrade! Jerry, we're simply trying to figure out what's really going on here. And so far, we've found a few clues. It might, no it might not lead us to the culprit right now, but it is a good first step. I don't know about this. You two are acting quite suspicious, if you ask me. Jerry, listen. He pats Lestrade on the shoulder, then walks with him a few steps. You're the prefect here, yes? And proud of it. And you know that some people here don't take you quite seriously, yes? They don't? I'm afraid not. But listen. Perhaps if you help John and I with the situation, it'll go a long way to making people people accept you in a position of authority. In law enforcement, you have to know when to accept help, or, so as my older brother Mycroft tells me, and he's in law enforcement. Isn't that all you've ever wanted? Well, of course it is. Then help us out, won't you? You can count on me, Holmes. Excellent. Well, I, well, we've found two clues so far, so what do we do now, Sherlock? I'd like to speak to someone about this situation. I think it could shed a bit more light on the situation. Lestrade, if you'll come with John and me, I think with more numbers, it'll work out better for us. Lead the way, Holmes. We fade into the dormitory room of Jarvis and Moriarty. Holmes, Lestrade, and Watson are standing before Jarvis while Moriarty stands off to the side. Ugh, why are you three squirts bothering me again? We'd just like to ask you a few questions, that's all. I already told everyone what I know. Well, refresh my memory. Yeah, tell him everything you remember about the event. Jarvis balls his hand into a fist and glares at Lestrade, who shrinks back. That's okay with you. If you runs must know, me and James were sitting in this room playing cards when suddenly the lights went out. We thought maybe someone was robbing the school, and we sure as heck did want to be around to see who it was. So, we made our way back to the Christmas party in the main ballroom. Isn't that right, James? It is. That sounds like it makes sense. It could, but perhaps you can answer this question. The lights were only out in the ballroom and in the hallway. Your dorm room isn't connected to either of those rooms. How did your lights go out, too? You really are a nosy little know-it-all, aren't you? I'm merely asking Jarvis a question. He's allowed to answer for himself, isn't he? All eyes turn to Jarvis, who is silent for several beats. You answer, James. These squirts are making me mad. Come now, Jarvis. It's a simple question. How did your lights go out? Or did they go out at all? I'm gonna slug you in about two seconds, you little. Jarvis, please, don't waste your time on these losers. Holmes, even you have to admit the evidence against Grace is quite damning. The scepter was white, right in her dress, and we can't account for her whereabouts when the lights went out. I think you'll find, James, that I'd rather look at all the facts before I make up my mind. I said it before and I'll say it again. He's blinded by his little puppy dog crush on her. Pathetic. Yes, but you've shown interest in her too, haven't you? True, but I'm not a fool. I don't let infatuation cloud my judgment. She had the scepter on her, for heaven's sake. It's up and in shot, if you ask me. Jarvis has since let go of Holmes' collar, leaving a noticeable dirt stain on it. I suppose that's your right to think that. Black Jarvis, don't you ever wash your hands? What are you getting at, you little busybody? You stain Sherlock's shirt and look for yourself. Huh. Strange. 
Why are your hands so dirty, Jarvis? He was helping me move my desk around, and it was dusty from lack of cleaning. Does that answer your question? For now, yes. We shall return, though. Please, make it a point not to. I insist. He pushes the three boys out of the room. Well, we just stumbled upon another clue, it seems. Right. Jarvis's hands. Ugh. Who knows how many germs those two ruffians have circulating in their room. It's enough to make you sick. I think we're on the right track, gentlemen. Come on. Let's see if we can spot any more clues. I think I may have something to contribute. Sherlock? By all means, John. Share it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't withhold evidence from us. It's an arrestable offense. Right. Do you remember at the ball when I noticed how cold Jarvis's hands were? As a matter of fact, I do. Could that possibly mean he might have been outside at at some point? It is December, after all. Ah, uh, an excellent point, John. And I think that's another clue. Holmes, how do you suppose Jarvis might have been the one to open those windows? It's entirely possible. Though with Moriarty to vouch for him, it'll be tough to prove. Moriarty is a tough egg to crack, though. He seems to have an answer for everything. I can already see that, Jerry. But we've come this far already. No sense in turning back. Hello? What's this? I think Sherlock spotted something we couldn't see. Again! How does he do it? I asked that my I asked myself that a lot too. Take a look at this, boys. There's a ledge up where the window up by the windowsill. Huh. Guess I never noticed it. It's always just focused on walking to class every day. Where do you suppose it leads? Why ask when we can all see? Come on. Are you sure about this, Holmes? You're not afraid of climbing. Are you, Lestrade? Of course not. It's the falling I'm afraid of. We black out, and lights on in Moriarty and Jarvis's room. The two are pantomiming a conversation when suddenly, from a side entrance, Holmes crawls his way into the room, followed by Watson and then Lestrade. What the? So, that window led to a footpath that leads over here. You three again. I thought I told you squirts to get out of our room. Calm yourself, James. We were merely exploring something we hadn't noticed before. Well, if you don't get out of here, we're going to merely beat the stuffing out of you. Okay, okay, we're going, sheesh. Not just yet, James. I have a few more questions I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind. I said get out. James, how was it exactly that you knew about Professor Duval not getting the promotion to Vice Dean recently? Now it's your business, but I overheard him talking about it during my time volunteering to cre the clean up Headmistress Merlin's office. Ah, yes. Wasn't that the stalwart pro program that the Meriwether Academy had in place for a time? Y yes, yes, it was. Is that all for your questions? Almost. Tell me, James, one more time. Why were you made moving the furniture around here again? I already told you. Jarvis and I thought we saw a few mice in here, so we were checking it out. Uh-huh. And before the lights went out tonight, you were doing what again? Oh, for heaven's sakes, we were playing jacks. Jacks. Is that so hard to understand? Of course not. Will you excuse us, please? He slowly ushers himself, Lestrade, and Watson out. Lights out, and then lights up to the hallway where the three boys are entering. This just gets more and more bizarre as the hours pass, doesn't it? You could say that again. Sherlock, what do you make of all this? Sherlock? Judgment, I believe I might have an idea of what's going on here. You do? Indeed. Sherlock! Sherlock! That sounds like... Grace! Grace rushes on stage with Amaryllis in tow. 
It is. Grace, where have you been? My father had me stay in my room till everything calmed down and we could discuss more. But I was just so upset. I was pacing the room. I couldn't bear to be alone with all this going on, so I snuck out. Well, don't worry about a thing, Grace. I feel as if I've got an idea of what's really going on here. You do? Do? Yes. Come now, everyone. Let's go find Professor Duval and the headmistress. Then I can explain everything. I'll catch up with you in a moment. I just need to clear my head before I face my father and the headmistress again. I'll stay with her. Of course. And don't worry, Grace. All of us know you're innocent, and I intend to prove it. Thank you, Sherlock. The three boys head off as Grace watches Sherlock go with a smile. She sighs for a moment, trying to clear her head. You'll clear your name, Grace. If anyone can do it, they can. Well, hello there, Grace. Oh, it's you. Oh, come now. Why such a sad face, hmm? You're much more beautiful when you smile, you know. You have some nerve speaking to her right now, after what you've accused her of doing. Silence! Amaryllis yelps and hides behind Grace. Moriarty sighs, dripping with false sincerity. Alas, Grace, I humbly apologize to you. Perhaps, perhaps I was a bit hasty in my accusing you. I mean, none of us are perfect. Myself included. Grace does not answer him. She simply humps and turns away. Slowly, like a spider circling a fly in his web, Moriarty walks around her to face her. Perhaps we can work something out here, Grace. We both are mature people, don't you think? What on earth makes you think I would want to work out anything with the likes of you? Hear me out, won't you? I'll make a deal with you. And if you say yes to it, I will drop my accusations toward you. In fact, I will make sure the entire student body knows that I made a mistake in accusing you. Then we can all work together to find out who stole the scepter from the statue. And what do I have to do in return? Pray tell. Be mine, of course. Grace looks horrified, almost ill at the thought. Come on now. Think about it. I can offer you the world. My parents are both very rich and powerful people in England. Perhaps over a date we can spark some sort of flame? So what do you say, my dear? Yes or no? Grace doesn't answer. Amarilla shakes her head no. Moriarty continues. Come now, Grace. I'm offering you the biggest out of your life. You'll be in the clear if I take back my accusation. And I'll save you and your father from massive embarrassment. Come now, say yes, won't you? You want an answer? How's this for an answer? With that, Grace slaps Moriarty across the face. Moriarty grabs at his cheek and stumbles back a step, but he is soon recovered and is frowning. Amaryllis is frightened. You, you disgusting pig, you brute! I wouldn't want to be yours if the fate of the world depended on it. I'd rather be accused of something I didn't do than ever, ever be associated with the likes of you. Very well, then. You just made the biggest mistake of your life, my girl. I hope you enjoy an even bigger accusation from me about you and the scepter. With that, he heads off stage as Grace watches him go. Then she and Amaryllis hurry off the opposite way. Cut to Sherlock, Watson, Lestrade, Professor Duvall, and Headmistress Merlin in the main headmistress's office. Holmes is in the middle of speaking as this scene begins. So you see, Mr. and Miss, I think I might have figured out what's really going on here with this whole situation. Well, my boy, by all means, go on. It's nearly morning. Hard to believe we've been at this for almost the whole night. Well... You see, sir. Father, father! Grace? I told you to wait in your room until you were summoned. But father, you don't understand. James Moriarty, he... Professor Headmistress Merlin, a word with you, please. I've just gotten confirmation that Grace is the one who... Ahem. <clears throat> Moriarty, Jarvis, for once, I'm glad to see you. I was hoping you'd show up now that you have... Now that you have, I'd like to offer some clarity for what really happened. 
Never mind this fool. Professor, I just got a full confession from Grace, and I can prove it. You're lying. He tried to blackmail me into being his girlfriend. He said he'd drop his accusation if I were to become his. He did. I was there. Yo, fiend! My goodness. Such intrigue for children so young. Wouldn't you say, Duval? Enough of this. I've already heard one accusation launched against my daughter. I refuse to listen to another one. Now then, Master Holmes, you were here first, so you have the floor. But make it quick and to the point, boy. I'll only need a few moments, sir. Now then, let's go over the facts, shall we? At the ball tonight, the lights suddenly went out and the ball remained in the hallway. There was confusion and people rushing all about. And in said confusion, the scepter was stolen off the statue in the main hall. By, by Grace Duvall. Now, as we no doubt saw, there was quite a lot of room for error in the culprit's part. Eventually, with so many people scrutinizing and looking for the scepter, the culprit knew he would be caught. So, the fiend that he is planted the scepter on Grace's person to make it look like she had done the crime. Yes, yes, that's all well and good, Master Holmes. But how? And why? We still don't know those answers yet. Allow me to elaborate, sir. Now, recall, we all thought it was rather strange that the lights all suddenly went out until I discovered that the windows in the ballroom were all forced open. Someone was looking to get gusts of wind to blow out the lights. Furthermore, not only did we discover smudges on the window sill, indicating that someone was outside the building opening them, but we also saw the very same smudges on the statue. Which leads me to you, Jarvis. Huh? Why me? As the straw correctly pointed out, your hands were quite dirty when we spoke to you tonight. Grace, if you recall, wore gloves to the party. That's right. I remember her talking at length about those silly things. And remember, as John pointed out, Jarvis's hands were freezing to the touch when he and James arrived on the scene during the blackout. Almost as if he had been outside while this was going on. That's pure nonsense. I told you, we were playing cards when the lights went out. I thought it was Jax you were playing. Uh, You've changed uh, your story, James. I clearly said Jax both times. And, as I recall, first you said that Jarvis's hands got dirty because you were moving furniture to clean your room. And then you said it was to check for mice. Which one is it? Well, it was... You see, you are making me nervous with all your nosy questions. He's insufferable, isn't he? With how he acts so high and mighty. This isn't about him. It's about you, boy. Now hush up. Continue, Holmes. Oh, and James, one last thing. As I recall, you told me about the stalwart program where you were cleaning in this very office and overheard the conversation about Professor Duval and about he had failed his promotion. Yes, yes, yes. I told you about it. What of it? I find it quite interesting, considering our school doesn't and never did have a stalwart program. I hate to lie to anyone, but I had to take a chance at the moment seeing that you had confirmed you were in something that didn't ex exist only fueled my suspicions. Moriarty, you spy on my personal conversations, do you? What? No, of course not. I just... Would you like me to take a guess as to what I really think happened here? I deduct that Jarvis was the one who took the scepter... And when he had panicked about being caught, he hid it in Grace's person. And did Moriarty have anything to do with it? Certainly not. Jarvis, I am shocked. You might not have taken it directly, no. Though at the very least, you're lying about what's going on here tonight and may have been orchestrating things behind the scenes. Grace, didn't you say several figures were bumping into you during the blackout? Yes, I remember. No doubt Jarvis and Moriarty used that as a cover to plant the scepter on you. Duval looms over Moriarty. These are very serious accusations, boy. 
not to mention ones that make logical sense, given what Holmes here has deduced. What have you got to say about this? Yes, James, what do you have to say? Can you offer any rebuttals or prove me wrong? If so, please tell us. I'm always one to admit when I'm mistaken. There's a long, drawn-out pause. Moriarty seems to be racking his brain for some kind of way out. He soon looks at Holmes with absolute hatred in his eyes. I could kill you for this, you snooping weasel! <sighs> Moriarty lunges at Holmes, who backs away. Professor Duvall holds Moriarty at bay. You couldn't just leave things alone, could you? Why do you always have to swoop in like some white knight? when I try and get things done around here. Okay, you want the truth? Fine. Jarvis and I did take the scepter. We took it to frame Grace. I did it to get back at her. Why do you like that fool more than me? I have everything in life that you could possibly want. He has nothing. Why, why, why? I think you've answered your own question with what you did to me tonight. Indeed you did, Moriarty. You and Jarvis are in a mountain of trouble, boy. I shall make sure you two are expelled from this academy. You're lucky no charges are pressed against you. But, but that isn't fair. He made me do it, sir. Honest. Leave it, Jarvis. If I go down, I'm taking you with me. Lestrade, come here, boy. Put that prefect position of yours to good use. Hold these two here with Headmasters Merlin while we contact their parents. Lestrade is excited. It's a shining moment. Yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. I've been waiting my whole life to do this. You're both coming with me. Sherlock, it was a pleasure working with you. He salutes and hauls Jarvis out of the room as Moriarty struggles to be led out by Headmistress Merlin. This isn't over. Not by a long shot. You've ruined me, you little cretin. I'll never forget this. I hate you. I hate your guts, Holm. Someday, I'll get my revenge on you. You'll see. You'll see. He is gone along with Headmistress Merlin. Jerry Lestrade is so brave. Father! Oh, my dear sweet angel. I'm so sorry. I should have believed you from the start. I knew that Moriarty wasn't a good egg. And this only proves it. Oh, my dear. Can you ever forgive an old fool like me? Of course, Father. And as for you, Holmes... He slowly puts out his hand for a shake. My boy, Grace and I both owe you thanks. You were one of the only people who believed in her from the start. Not only that, but you and Watson here both used your heads to solve this little crisis. See, this is what I meant by using your gift of intelligence correctly. You certainly showed it tonight. Watson? Holmes? I'm proud of you for figuring this out without causing any trouble. Believe you me, this will not go unnoticed. I'll make sure you are both properly honored for this when we come back from our break in the new year. And for Lestrade, too? Yes, for Lestrade, too. <sighs> you mean it, sir? I do. Now then, why don't we all try and get a little bit of sleep before we have to start making our way to our homes for the break? I, I don't think I can sleep a wink after this. It was so exciting. I agree. Duvall looks at his pocket watch. Goodness, you might be right. It's nearly dawn. Well, I'm going to my chambers to finalize my packing. Grace, join me when you can, won't you? Of course, Father. Duvall nods and heads off as Watson, again seeing the two want to be alone, speaks. I think I forgot to pack a few things. I shall return. Come, Amaryllis. The two leave as well. Grace and Holmes, linking hands, walk over to the other side of the room. Soon, the two of them are alone and Grace hugs Holmes. Oh, Sherlock, you are amazing. Thank you. Anytime, Grace. But I can't take all the credit. John did a lot to help, and so did you. But you were the one who finally coxed those slip-ups from James that proved he and Jarvis were the culprits. Oh, Sherlock, is there anything you can't do? Oh, uh, gee, I 
don't know about all that. I'm certainly not perfect. You are to me. And and you are to me too. I'll never forget that you were the only one that, who believed I was innocent from the start. Just the way you defended me, even when everyone else said not to. You're so wonderful, Sherlock. I'll always remember you did this for me. The two are now gazing into each other's eyes. There is silence for several moments, then... Well, here we are again. Yes, here we are again. So, what should we do now, hmm? We only have a few moments before I need to leave with my father for the Christmas break. Holmes doesn't answer. Slowly, he looks up at something that is hanging from above them. It's a bit of mistletoe. Well, would you look at that? What is it? Mistletoe. Mm -hmm. So there is. I, I think tradition dictates that people standing under this have to do a certain something, don't they? That they do. But do you want to know something? What? I don't need mistletoe to do what I'd like to do right now. Slowly, Grace puts a hand to Holmes' cheek, and she kisses him on the lips. Goodbye, Sherlock. Merry Christmas. M Merry Christmas, Grace. She giggles and runs off as Holmes stands stone still, a stunned look on his face which soon turns into a wide, smitten grin. Watson comes up to Holmes. Sherlock, we better get started on our pack unpacking our suitcases. Our parents will be here soon. Sherlock? Holmes! He waves a hand in front of Sherlock's face. Are you there, friend? Sherlock, what has gotten into you? She... She kissed me. Huh? Grace, she... She kissed me, John. She did. Holmes nods. Just now? Holmes nods again. Watson smiles and laughs. <laughs> oh, wow! That's great, Sherlock! What a better way to end this whole crazy adventure. What was it like? Picture all the most wonder th wonderful things in the world that have ever happened in your life. And then multiply it by a million. <sighs> hmm. That good? Very much so. Well, I'm happy for you, Sherlock. This seems like the absolute best Christmas present one can get, eh? You can say that again. No amount of gifts can equal the girl of your dreams liking you as much as you like her. Well, I can tell this feeling's gonna carry over for quite a while, eh, chum? No doubt about it. I've got to tell you, Sherlock, you did some fine work with all this. I still can't get over how amazed I am that you did that. Come now, Watson. You, Grace, and Lestrade all helped me out, too. It wasn't all me. But you came in when it counted most. I really admire that about you, Sherlock. You know, I wonder, have you ever thought of becoming a detective of some sort when you're older? Maybe having a job solving cases that seem unsolvable. You know... Thought never crossed my mind, to be honest. But it's certainly something to consider. <laughs> the two boys laugh and head off as the stage goes dark. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That is the end of our program. Now, usually around this time, we would be uh, taking bows, but since, you know, everybody is at their homes. They were just going to do virtual bows. Um, thank you. To, thank you. To, <laughs> oh, gosh. I tried to bow and I hit my head. Thank you. Thank you very much to Michael Riley, Ashley Miller, Jason Amherst, Toria Curdilla. 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 <laughs> Reese Arbizu. And Talon yeah, Arbus, you, know you know what it hey. is. Alwyn Connors, Nathan Kasoy, and Thank our you. leading lady, Shannon Ship, and our leading man, Jackson Babalus. Thank you very much. Now, just uh, before, we, 
before we conclude this evening, I'd like to uh, uh, talk about some of our upcoming programs because this is the first of many uh, online stage readings. By the way, um, apologies for some of the uh, hiccups in uh, recording. Of course, technology isn't perfect sometimes, but uh, everybody here was on the ball and they did very well. A uh, round of applause once more for this fine collection of people here. Thank you. Thank you. Now the next, amongst our upcoming programming, uh, we will be doing a staged reading of Rip the System, and that stars the wonderfully talented Hudson Barry. Um, you will be seeing Victoria and Talon again because they are the leads in another one of our upcoming uh, staged readings, The Witches in the Woods. So look forward to that. We, uh, we will have a night of short scenes. And uh, the lovely Juliana Souza will be joining us for that, as well as Emily Glasser and several other, a host of other stars. Uh, Ichabod's Ghost, which, will, which stars the incomparable Michael Riley, he's going to be in that show. I'm in that show too, God knows why. Um, <laughs> we're going to be putting on the Guardian game uh, that stars the lovely Shannon Chip and uh, just a, a host of others. As, I mean, as we know, uh, theater is a very wonderful thing, and bringing it, bringing this together, it went so well. I don't. I I really am so amazed at how talented everybody here is performing. I've often said that uh, a director is only as good as his actors, and if that's the case, then I just I'm very I'm a great director because <laughs> you know I'm complimenting all of you, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, oh thank, thank you. Thank you. You're, you're really good. Uh... I mean, like I, I don't I don't just say that just to hear the sound of my own voice because you know my voice could shatter mirrors. Take this as a compliment, everybody, but I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, you got you missed the you're missing the central message. We we got it. We got it, Dane. You're good. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we all caught it. Okay. So um thank you very much everyone for tuning in. I know um the stream was going a little wackadoodle, but um we do have we do have the uh, recording already and it will be uh anybody who uh missed it or if you want to listen to it again, it'll be up soon. So uh, that's it for now. Yay. Thank you very much. If the cast could just stay behind for just one minute, I just want to uh, talk with them off the air. Uh, thank you very much, and have a great night. And uh, remember to wash your hands. Bye! Bye. Bye.